from St. Louis Public Radio. This is Politically Speaking. With five weeks remaining in the 2022 Missouri legislative session, the House and Senate have still not reached a consensus on a congressional map. While the Senate, after months of at times contentious debate, finally passed their version of a map a few weeks ago, the House is not a fan and has repeatedly requested a conference committee in attempts to reach a compromise. On this episode of Politically Speaking, Republican State Senator and member of the Conservative Caucus, Bill Eigel, joins us to talk about the state's redistricting efforts. Eigel himself is a proponent of a map with seven Republican seats and one Democratic one. He also talks about the state of the Missouri Senate, as well as some of the things he would like to accomplish in the remainder of session. Let's hit the music. This is the Politically Speaking Podcast, the definitive show about Missouri politics. We have to talk about things that matter to people. I've tried to bring that same aggressive iconoclast style with me to uh, the United States Senate. I think my district is a model for the state. We put Missourians first. You just kind of have to find the common ground with people. I believe that this district deserves someone who represents their values. After I came back to St. Louis, I started thinking that I could have a bigger role on the change that I wanted to make. Welcome to Politically Speaking. I'm your host, State House and Politics reporter Sarah Kellogg. Joining me for the first time in months in St. Louis is my co host, St. Louis Public Radio's political correspondent. Jason Rosenbaum, great to be back, Sarah, and you did a fabulous job with the podcast while I was on FMLA leave. Well, thank you. Welcome back. Uh, Our guest today joining us via Zoom, he is the Republican senator representing the 23rd District in the Missouri Senate, which includes part of St. Charles County. State Senator Bill Eigel, happy to be here. Thank you for joining us on the show, Senator. Before we get started, I'd love for you if you reminded our listeners about your district, where it covers, who you represent. Sure. So I I represent the 23rd State Senatorial District. It's basically Eastern St. Charles County. So that includes all of St. Charles City, uh, almost all of St. Peter's and portions of Cottleville and and, uh, Weldon Spring, where I'm actually from in the southern part of the county. All right. So (laughs) I think we're going to start just kind of it's the elephant in the room. Why do you feel that this session has been so difficult so far? Uh, well, I, I think it's, it's on one hand, it's mystifying to some, but for me, it's actually pretty simple. I, I think when we came into session in January, I, I felt like there was a list of priorities of, of things that uh, the people that elected us wanted to address. And unfortunately, as, as we stand here today on April 8th, I feel like we, we've hardly addressed any of them. Uh, everything from addressing uh, COVID mandates, everything from addressing uh, protecting uh, rights, uh, protecting how we see uh, parents and kids in our schools, uh, but trying to get the budget and the spending situation under control, uh, taxation, all of the big things that uh, Republicans would expect to see get done from a Republican supermajority, uh, very little. Uh, in fact, I, I would make the case that nothing has actually been accomplished yet. In fact, some of the only things that we have done over in the Missouri Senate are things that I think are incredibly out of step with the GOP platform and brand. I mean, we passed a small free college program called Fast Track out of uh, the Republic, uh, out of a Republican-controlled Senate that is more in line with what I think Bernie Sanders would uh, support than any uh, uh, real Republican. So uh, it's it's been frustrating. It's been frustrating, and I know there's a lot of frustration in that chamber. But let's not forget that there's a lot of frustration with Republican primary voters that were expecting a lot more. And uh, unless we start getting back to the the principles and, and things that we promised that we were going to do in election season, then I think we're going to continue to see the Senate struggle. So disagreement in the Senate is is not a new characteristic. There's often been fierce debates between the parties or within a caucus. It seems like things this year are just becoming especially personal, whether it's Senator Seapore going after for Senator Lemke or how some of Senator Rowden's staff members have been targeted. What's happened? Yeah, it, and, and I agree I, I agree with your assessment there. And, and yeah, that has been an, an extra distraction that we've seen some of these personal attacks come out. I mean, just this week, we saw Senator Holly Rader going after some of us, I think, including myself, calling uh, certain senators cowards and hypocrites. And, you know, I, I've tried not to really, I, I haven't tried to make any of these attacks personal, you know, uh, voting records, uh, what you're doing in, in the course of your, your, your position is, is pretty, Uh, It's not a personal attack, it's just kind of the facts of where we are, but it's been very unfortunate to see uh, some of the members of the chambers uh, make these personal attacks. Uh, And I think that that tells you just that they clearly don't have a lot of 
uh, confidence in the positions that they're taking in these votes. So uh, it's very disappointing. And you know, I would agree that it's not helping anything at all. And uh, the more we can turn the, the discussion back to policy, uh, that'll give us the best chance, I think, of actually getting something done. We'll get into this a little bit more specifically when we talk about redistricting, but there seems to be a contention from people outside the conservative caucus, which for our listeners is kind of a group of senators that have been chafing against GOP leadership for like well over a year, if not longer. The contention I've heard is that a lot of your actions are are, are aimed at propelling future political aspirations are bolstering your profile rather than actually accomplishing conservative tasks. And I'm sure you've heard that on the floor. And I think that you deserve a chance to respond to that contention. You know, I, you know, for me, I, <laughs> I think that there's a, there's an old saying that the party out of power wants power. The party in power wants purity. And I think the Republicans have been in power so long, which is going on 20 years now, that we're at a point where uh, the people who continually send these Republicans back to Jefferson City are really starting to wonder, you know, why are we sending all these Republicans down to Jefferson City and yet we get the largest tax increase in the history of the state on our gas of all things uh, last year? Why are we passing policies that don't look anything like what the GOP platform said, whether it gives, I mentioned the, the free college program or whatever it is, why can't we pass a 7-1 map uh, when we have an opportunity to do so and other states are not squandering their opportunity to change the makeup of their federal delegations, why can't we do those things with super majorities of Republicans? So uh, it's, it has nothing to do with anybody's individual profile. It has to do with the fact that there is a growing number of senators, uh, primarily the conservative caucus, but I would make the case that there are other Republicans as well that are interested in getting back to the roots and the policies that we promised that we were going to support uh, when we were going through campaign season. And the frustration that I'm hearing from around the state, not just from St. Charles, where I'm from, but, but around the state of Republicans that are voting for higher taxes, that for Republicans that are voting for out of control spending, for Republicans that are voting for all these programs, taking on the record votes uh, a, a directly against, in many cases, the GOP platform, I think is raising the profile of other candidates and other races that are challenging uh, these Republicans that are deviating from the platform. So uh, it's not about one person. It's about the fact that I'm tired about here. I'm tired of hearing about states like Florida doing all the great Republican things. We've got more Republicans elected to office in Missouri. We need to get those big things done. So, you know, as I've been watching this session, one of the claims against some of the actions against the conservative caucus is that you all are attaching amendments to a bill that would it have left unamended, you know, maybe it would have passed to the Senate pretty easily. And so these amendments making them partisan or calling them poison pills, uh, these amendments have also been called beyond the scope of the underlying bill. I want to get your thoughts on that, especially since, you know, as of late with only a couple weeks left of the session, you know, five weeks left, you know, we are seeing more amendments being brought bills, not just by the conservative caucus. Yeah. And actually, uh, one of the the good things about being a senator is the fact that uh, we have the ability to offer amendments to bills uh, to uh, promote uh, priorities of ours that for whatever reason may not be coming up on their own. Uh, trying to push back against critical race theory is a good example. Uh, we just now this week, here we are five weeks left in session and saw the education committee finally uh, vote out a critical race theory uh, ban of some sort. And quite frankly, I have no idea if or when the bill that just got put on the calendar for that subject is going to even make it to the floor because we're so late in session. So what we have to do if we want to see action taken is we have to find other bills that are up for uh, debate that we can push forward uh, our priorities and try to attach to that bill so that if nothing else, uh, the people of this state are going to see where certain senators are going to fall on these issues. I mean, I take the, uh, the fast track bill that came up uh, earlier in the session. I think this was one of the, the high interest items where amendments were offered on that bill in particular. We offered amendments uh, that would have restricted the fast track program from going towards any higher education institutions that allowed uh, transgender athletes in women's sports that would have that would have disallowed higher education institutions from taking part if they enrolled unlawfully unlawful citizens and residents of the state of Missouri. And yet you had Republicans going on the record voting against those types of amendments. So, uh, you know, the, the frustration, again, is increasing. And I, I think you've seen uh, frustration uh, rise from some of the members of the Senate because I don't know if they've been put under this kind of pressure before. But uh, that's where we're at. And if we don't start applying this pressure, then we risk losing the support of the people that have been sending these Republicans to Jefferson City in the first place for the past 20 years. 
I want to talk a little bit about uh, the House and the Senate. What do you think has been the big disconnect between the House and the Senate this year? It's not like House Speaker Vescovo is considering, you know, squishy liberal, you know, agendas. Shouldn't you be on the same same page? Yeah, you would think so. Uh, and, and to their credit, I'll say that this, the House has passed some good legislation. Uh, they've passed some of the priorities that, that we would like to address. Uh, on the other hand, I, I think that a lot of the Senate versus House conversation gets caught up in the redistricting. Uh, conversation because quite frankly, and I'll be, I'll be as candid as I can here, I think they passed a terrible map. Uh, they passed a map that I consider a 5-3 map. And the reason I want to, and I've said this before, but the reason I consider that original house redistricting map a 5-3 map is because uh, the, the second congressional district, in addition to drawing two democratic safe seats, the second congressional district as drawn under the house map uh, was only won by Josh Hawley by less than two points in 2018 and is primarily made up of St. Louis County, which given its trends towards the Democratic column, I think that a Democrat's going to be filling that seat by the middle of the decade. So in a best case scenario, that map's a five and a half, two and a half map now moving towards a five, three. So uh, because the, the the House has not really been willing to uh, uh, discuss or compromise, you know, we're, we're kind of stuck. And so it took the Senate a long time to get a map of our own. Uh, but now it, it feels like it probably feels like there's more friction between the Senate and the House than there actually is, primarily because uh, the conversation is being dominated by the redistricting uh, agenda. Senator, that was an excellent segue into redistricting. Segue <laughs> you, you even though I was gone for two and a half months, don't you think do not believe that Jason Rosenbaum was not paying attention to the redistricting debate? Because sometimes when I was holding my child, I was listening to the Senate and it was thoroughly entertained by it. But I, I, I have I, I want to go to that second district and I want to talk about the second district that the Senate passed out. And, you know, it, it includes parts of St. Louis, St. Charles, Washington, Franklin and Iron County. And it, it also happens to take in my house in Richmond Heights. And if I walk down the block and pass by a hospital, that's in Mo one from the eye test. This looks like a ridiculous looking district and it has it features places that have nothing to do with one another. H how can you defend that district making any sense? So that first of all, that's a great question. And the first thing I'd tell you uh, is that the map that the Senate passed was far from the best map the Senate could have passed. Uh, I voted I voted for that map because I felt like that was the very best map that at that time that the Senate was going to produce. But that being said, I had about 35 maps that would have been uh, for a variety of reasons from a compactness perspective, from a uh, visual uh, beauty perspective, uh, which I think is what you're referring to, Jason, from a uh, communities of interest perspective would have been a heck of a lot better uh, than the map that ultimately did get passed out of the Senate. The reason we ended up with that kind of awkward looking map is because I think we had a an, an, an tremendous amount of undue influence, uh, primarily from Congress people, uh, from the second and the third and Wagner, and in particular, Blaine Lutemeyer, who were making constant phone calls uh, directly and through their consultants' palm strategy to try to influence not just the Republican Democratic makeup of their districts, but particular which Republicans they could represent, because uh, it was pretty clear to me that uh, there was a lot of discomfort uh, from Blaine Luke Meyer's perspective if he was going to have to try to market himself to Republicans that he hadn't previously uh, uh, represented before. And primarily, he was looking at my county, St. Charles. Uh, so, you know, that was a lot of frustration for me. And uh, I tell you what, I just feel like, it, you know, if the, if the federal delegation, those two members in particular, had just not made as many phone calls and did not interrupt the process as much as they did, I think there's a really good chance we could have come away with a much better map uh, long before the two and a half months it actually ultimately took to get the Senate to pass something. You know, now where we're at is I know that there are some conversations going on between certain House members and certain Senate members, uh, and we'll see what those look like because I'm certainly open. I'm still open, as I was two months ago, uh, to, to getting a map that uh, was going to uh, kind of shore up the second congressional district a bit more. It was going to try to preserve some of the communities of interest. I still think there's a better solution out there, as I've always said, but kind of that's where we're at right now. So my hope is uh, we can uh, stay out of the way uh, or that the federal delegation uh, and those two Congress people in particular will stay out of the way long enough for us to get something done. 
There is a Twitter account called Missouri Mapper, who, by the way, whoever he or she is, does a fantastic job of redistricting analysis. I want to give a shout out to them, who mentioned that the obvious solution to this impasse is to put Jefferson County in Mo 3 and all of St. Charles County in Mo 2. Um, right. But I think the biggest impediment to reaching that solution is a lot of Republicans are so upset with the tactics that both you and Senator Onder have employed over the last year that they don't even want to provide any possibility that either one of you could ever be elected to Congress. Do you think that that is kind of the genesis behind why that solution hasn't been ratified a month or two ago? No, I, I actually I, I think that's a fake issue. Uh, I mean, here, let me expand on that a little bit. First of all, I am never going to run for Congress. So I'll, I'll say that up front. I, I've gotten so breaking much news. Hair. So I'm going to put that in stone. I've gotten so much gray hair uh, just in the in the state Senate. I am confident saying I'm never going to run for Congress. Uh, and quite frankly, I think I think uh, Bob Onder is running for county executive, so he's got his sights set on trying to serve the people. I, I know that, but the idea that his con- congressional aspirations right. have, have are gone since 2008. I'm I'm sure, sorry, I, I just don't believe I, I that. I totally, totally continue. Understand. I understand where that that comes from. I understand why that concerns out there. I just put that as a caveat to say that fair, I, fair I enough. Continue. Don't think uh, that. that uh, probably as likely as maybe folks are afraid, but I would also say, ironically, you know, when the when the uh, when the conversation about the maps uh, first began back in January, uh, I actually did get a lot of feedback from other senators that were concerned about, you know, we we don't know if we want to put St. Charles together because we don't kind of want you to have your way. Ironically enough, as the conversation got stretched out longer and longer and longer, folks were actually no longer willing to uh, make their decisions based on some sort of personal agenda like that. It just wanted to get a map done. So by the time we got to the middle of March, folks were just, you know, they weren't worried. You know, senators from the other side of the state uh, were, were no longer worried about trying to influence what St. Charles looked like. They just wanted to get a good map done, which is ultimately what led to the environment that produced some sort of map out of the, out of St. Charles. Now, I've talked to a, a lot of the several House members uh, about the maps uh, just in this past week. And, you know, it's easy I think to point to say, oh, well, you know, we don't want to draw maps that are going to, you know, benefit somebody's political aspirations. But I think at this point, folks are just looking for a way uh, to get a map that makes sense, that can make it through the chamber. And I in, I think you mentioned an example right there, whether it's we, we do something with Jefferson County and put that in uh, back into the third. Uh, I, I actually have drawn maps with Jefferson County all together fully within the third district, and at the same time having St. Charles County all together fully within the second. Uh, so those maps exist, and we can take those maps. And I, I think those those are precisely the conversations that are going on behind the scenes. And I'm relatively optimistic that at one point, some point or another, we are going to come to a compromise. And I think that folks are so exhausted from this that they're not going to be able to maintain the personal agendas uh, at this point in the process, like maybe we were pursuing back in January. And now I want to go to the whole seven to one issue because you've been a big advocate of that. And I don't want to, like, leave that out of this conversation. Um, And when I say seven to one, I think it's important for our listeners to understand what a seven to one map is. That would be taking the fifth district, which is currently represented by Emanuel Cleaver, a Democrat from Kansas City, which is now like a plus 10 Democratic district. And making it a plus 15 Republican district, which is possible. I want to make that clear. Republicans could do that if they wanted to. Um, And you've cited how Illinois Democrats absolutely brutalized Illinois Republicans and that Missouri Republicans should not unilaterally disarm. But I want to play a clip now from Republican Congressman Rodney Davis talking about how that strategy employed by Democrats could actually backfire you don't have to look too far than just you know eyeballing this congressional map to see the gerrymandered mess that it is but even with that gerrymandered mess democrats ought to be very concerned that they didn't make some of those districts throughout downstate illinois and the collar counties and the suburbs democratic enough i think we can really win some of those districts not at the end of the decade i think we can even do it at the beginning of this decade So I don't think that if you put Kansas City into the fourth and the sixth that Democrats could win in 2022. But I think that the concern and the reason why a seven to one map isn't happening is there's fear that it could turn into a dummy mander 
and then you suddenly have three competitive seats out of Kansas City where Republicans have to spend a lot of resources to, to maintain in 24, 26, and 28. What, what do you make of that? So I, I find I, this is a great question, and I find it ironic that folks are actually talking about this because the House map, uh, which the, the, the second congressional under the original House map had a Josh Hawley margin of 2018 of 1.9% and a Donald Trump margin of 2020 of, of 4.9%. The 7-1 maps uh, that we've drawn in every case, all seven seats had greater margins than the second district did under the 5-3 map that came out of the House. So if margins are the concern, right? If, if we're, we're concerned about drawing districts that are just too close to the edge that we afraid that there we might go uh, Democrat at some point, then, uh, then I don't know why anybody would be supporting the House map <laughs> because that actually had worse margins than the 7-1 maps that we've been proposing and that we actually took a vote on on the Senate floor. So in addition, uh, if you look at uh, the seven one maps, none of those seven seats had the overwhelmingly uh, blue leaning trends like the second congressional had under the five three or even some of the six two versions uh, due to St. Louis County uh, on, on the other side of things. So I, I'm not really concerned uh, about the Democrats getting stronger in the state of Missouri because quite frankly, their national brand, which weighs heavily on these federal races, uh, is, is incredibly problematic uh, for anywhere, pretty much anywhere outside of the first congressional in the state of Missouri. So I, I think that this is a, uh, not only can we make better margins, and here's what's really stunning. Uh, we talk about some of the constitutional priorities when it comes to drawing these maps. One of them is compactness. Uh, we had a long discussion on the Senate floor how in the 7-1 map that did break up uh, the, the areas in Kansas City and put them amongst multiple districts, the, the uh, computer algorithms that measure uh, compactness, an actual, an actual objective measure of compactness, scored the 7-1 maps better overall in terms of compactness than the 5-3 map that came out of the House. So I've been become fond of saying that by every objective measure, the 7-1 is actually better than anything we've seen before. It's better in terms of compactness. It's better in terms of Republican margin. It's better in terms of long-term uh, viability for the next 10 years in terms of the trend, the demographic and partisan trends in each of those seven areas. So I understand where Roddy's coming from over in Illinois. And I recognize that, gosh, you know, the Illinois map looks like they threw spaghetti against the wall. So absolutely, there may, they may have overthought that a bit much. We saw the same, we're seeing the same thing in the state of New York, where they did the exact same thing and tried to draw out two or three Republican seats. But I think we, it is actually less risky uh, from a Republican margin perspective to draw the 7-1 maps that we've brought to the floor than it is the 6-2 or 5-3 maps that we've been discussing uh, because of how they've drawn the second district. We need to take a quick break, but we'll be right back. And we're back on Politically Speaking. I'm your host, St. Louis Public Radio's State House and Politics reporter, Sarah Kellogg. Joining me is my co-host, Jason Rosenbaum, political correspondent for St. Louis Public Radio. And our guest today is Republican Senator Bill Eigel, who represents the 23rd District, which includes parts of St. Charles County. Let's get back into it. We were in the middle of redistricting questions. We have yet more redistricting questions for you. Uh, <laughs> surprise. Um, so let's let's get into those. So some of the discourse during these past few weeks you know, has gotten very personal. We talked about that a little bit earlier. Um, I alluded to Senator Searpoint earlier. There's also a number of women senators that have been especially outspoken about 7-1 proponents tac uh, tactics. It's also notable that Senator Cindy Laughlin, who is part of the conservative caucus, has sided with the other members of the GOP caucus on this and other issues. What do you make of, you know, I don't think it's unfair to call it vitriol about these maps. Yeah, I, I guess... I don't understand. Well, maybe I do understand. I, I, I'm disappointed that it's become such a personal thing. Uh, I, I am not trying to draw any of these districts to try to influence a personal agenda for any other senator in the, in the Senate chamber. Uh, and I don't uh, take it personally. Uh, if somebody disagrees with me on what the map ought to look like, I, I don't take that personally. I, I respect that. That being said, I do think that there is a very difficult conversation that certain senators are are being forced to have with the people that elected them over 
uh, why they're not supporting a 7-1 map when for by almost every objective measure, a 7-1 map mathematically makes sense. And if you read the GOP platform, it says very clearly that we're going to do everything we can to elect as many Republicans as possible. So when you vote for a 6-2 map uh, and, without, and, and don't support the 7-1 map, if you vote for a 5-3 map without supporting the 7-1 map, uh, then you're deviating from the GOP platform. And I can tell you, I have said we have gotten engagement on this issue uh, from thousands of, of Missourians all over the state that are asking the same question. You know, I feel like there's 3 million Republican primary voters in the state. Probably about 50 of them out of the 3 million want to see a 6-2 drawn. And yet, ironically, of those 50, maybe 50 Republicans that want to see a 6-2 or a 5-3, Half of them happen to be in the Missouri Senate, <laughs> so so it's it's just there. I think that they're the reason this is becoming personal is because those senators that have stood up on the floor and and expressed outrage about a set possible seven one map or whatever it is, they're hearing they're they're not hearing from me. They're hearing from the people that elected them. In fact, uh, it, this has also spilled over into an election year in which, uh, unbelievably, I think six sitting Republican senators have received primary challenges. That's pretty unheard of. So it's affecting them uh, and their political careers uh, to be taking these kind of votes directly against the GOP platform. And, you know, they're upset about it. So uh, I, I, I understand it, but I'm not sure that uh, uh, this is kind of the consequence of when you continually uh, vote against the Republican platform, then th these are kind of the consequences. And I think they're feeling the heat. So uh, our last redistricting question, <laughs> we promise. Um, so kind of to sum where we are right now, the Senate passed a map, the House asked for conference, the Senate said no, the House voted that map down and again asked for conference. That's where we currently are. Um, right. And so la not this past week, but the week before, um, Senator Rowden said that anybody who doesn't want to go to conference is responsible for it to go to court, which is a chance of that being maybe a more Democrat leaning map. I guess I, I just kind of want your comments on that. Well. <laughs> Well, uh, I, I think I'm going to dis respectfully disagree with the uh, senator from Boone. Uh, we sent a map. We worked very hard on a map. It was a difficult process uh, for the Senate. And I'll be the first to tell you, it wasn't the best map that I felt we could have sent over. Uh, and, uh, you know, we sent that back to the House. They decided that they didn't want to accept that. Part of the reason that we're not going to conference is, quite frankly, uh, trust is so low, uh, not just from the conservative caucus, but trust is so low more broadly in the Senate chamber that no one trusts leadership enough to allow this this conference, allow a conference committee to take place. So I think that that, that I think that you may see leadership trying to deflect from the fact that the real problem here is just there's too many senators that don't trust leadership, um, and that's Republican and Democrat. So uh, I think what's going to happen instead is. Uh, the conversations are still taking place behind the scenes, whether whether we call it a conference or not. Uh, I think those conversations are being had. I've been a part of some of those conversations, and I think that in order to avoid a conference, uh, a conference motion situation, uh, I would expect uh, a bill, either the Senate bill or maybe another House bill, to move forward that represents uh, whatever the the additional compromise is going to be. So there are some things that I, I've talked to House members that they'd like to see in a final map that. I'm not opposed to, uh, and I think that they address some of the things, Jason, that you mentioned about uh, the second congressional uh, and how it's formed. But uh, I, I think those will come forward. It's just going to happen, I think, without the formality of, of a conference motion. So we're going to go to the final part, uh, and and Jason, I kind of it's a newer thing for us. It's kind of a lightning round. We have a series of questions. If you could keep your answers to about a couple sentences or less, uh, we have a couple more questions for you. Um, exciting. Like we like to th <laughs> we think it's fun. Uh, so <laughs> so in a couple sentences or less, uh, what are some of the priorities that you hope to get done this year? I want to get done a ban on vaccine mandates. I want to get done a ban on uh, critical race theory uh, and some of the things going on in our schools. We got to get the maps done and I'd like to find uh, room for a tax cut for the people of the state. What are your expectations on how the Senate will handle the budget uh, when it goes through the appropriations process? We spend way too much money in the state of Missouri. It's ridiculous how much money we spend. And I hope that the Senate will restore some sanity to what the governor has proposed. Why hasn't the allocation of money for Medicaid expansion been as controversial this year as I was expecting? That is not controversial to other Republicans, as I think is one more thing that they're going to have to answer for in many of the elections and primaries that are ongoing uh, currently. 
Do you think that the legislature will get ahead of a ballot initiative legalizing marijuana for adult use? No. Why? Because the there is a, there is sufficient disagreement within the Republican caucus about how and even if to legalize marijuana that it's difficult uh, to see a consensus forming in the last five weeks um, where that can be done outside of the initiative petition process. Another bill making its way through the legislature is legalizing sports betting. I know your caucus member, Senator Hoskins, has his own version of the bill. What are your thoughts on the House bill? Are you expecting to see changes to it uh, to make it maybe more like Hoskins' bill? So this is, uh, wait, short answers. Yes, I think it's going to look more like uh, Senator Hoskins' bills. Ultimately, when it gets to the floor and comes up for the final debate, I don't know if it's going to make it over the finish line. And this is not an issue that's kind of in my wheelhouse. But uh, Senator Hoskins has been a leader on this issue. I expect him to continue to be a leader uh, and the focal point of those discussions if we're going to see something completed. Do you think that the legislature will bar private entities from acquiring their employees from getting the COVID-19 vaccine? I think it's more likely that we will see a significant increase of support for the exemptions that must exist and be uh, maintained in the event that a private employer uh, actually does require a vaccine mandate. So I think that you're going to see everything, not just religious exemptions be upheld, but philosophical uh, exemptions be upheld and consequences for employers that don't honor those exemptions under state law. Our St. Louis Public Radio education reporter, Kate Grumpke, had a story out this week about the results of some school board elections in the region. It was pretty mixed. Candidates that would have been broadly classified as conservative won in Rockwood, Valley Park, and St. Charles County area school districts. They were unsuccessful in areas like Kirkwood and Parkway. What do you think these results mean for education legislation? So, uh, first of all, I agree that you had uh, probably, you know, you had some victories for the conservative cause and you had some losses for the conservative cause. What I would point out, though, is that relative to previous years and in other direction and other elections, we weren't seeing hardly any victories uh, in for conservative candidates in school board elections because the entrenched uh, teacher unions were very good about getting their turnout out and they're getting their message out in these off, uh, off elections in April that had very low turnout. So the fact that we've gone from almost no victories to maybe 50%, uh, I think is a dramatic, it's actually a very dramatic change. And if you look at the, if you look at St. Charles, uh, the campaigns in St. Charles where the candidates uh, did some fundraising, knocked on some doors and were organized, overwhelmed uh, the uh, union backed candidates, the teachers union backed candidates here in St. Charles County. We saw both of those candidates win in Francis House School District. Uh, we saw a, a candidate win in Wentzville School District. And actually we would have had a second, uh, I think a second candidate win in, in Wentzville School District, except for the fact that we had three candidates running and you kind of had a, a split vote there on the other side. But uh, I think it tells me that with uh, organized campaigns, these are the messages uh, that are going to win. And I think that's going to translate uh, to the August primaries, because in a bigger picture, these are the exact same kind of conversations that voters are going to be having with people that uh, are asking to represent them. That's all the time we have. Thank you so much, Senator Igel, for joining us on the show. Politically Speaking is a product of St. Louis Public Radio, which is a part of the University of Missouri-St. Louis. You can follow me on Twitter at Sarah K. Kellogg. You can follow Jason on Twitter at... Jay Rosenbaum. And Senator Eigel, where can people find you on the internet where you want to be found? <laughs> on Twitter, uh, Eigel for Mo, at I, or, excuse me, at Bill Eigel, and then on Facebook at uh, Eigel for Mo. All right. Until next time, so long. 